Good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you for being here. This is, it took a lot. I mean, I was, I was at home saying, jeepers, I'd like to Zoom this one today, except, <laughs> except I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so thank you. And think about this. Our seed of awakening for February is divine discontent. How about that? We're going to have a fun time this month looking at that. Now, when I was thinking about divine discontent, I was thinking about some people that I know who believe that God could be discontented, uh, angry, miffed, uh, punishing, jealous, and all of those emotions that we humans tend to feel, and that God is something and someone to be feared. I remember when I was a little kid, and my grandparents told me, God knows your thoughts. Well, okay, <laughs> tell that to any little kid. What do you suppose I started thinking, right? I started thinking bad thoughts because I was so afraid of God. But we do not believe in that kind of God for one moment. We believe that the divine is like the sun. It is shining all the time, even when we can't see it. It's still shining, and it shines on all alike. No matter what, it shines on all. It never chooses one over another. So, my friends, that means divine discontent is about us. We can become discontent with spirit when things don't go the way that we want or expect. It's easy to proclaim God is good when good things happen and when we get what we want. But guess what? God is good all the time, working for your good all the time, no matter what it looks like to you. I have this friend, Donna. She has made her transition now, but when she was going through her experience with cancer, we spent many hours praying for the release of tumors, for her markers to improve for all the medical model of healing. We prayed and prayed and prayed for that. And then one time when I came to see her, she said, you know, Susan, I'm done. Like, I'm tired of this. I'm ready to go. I'm not afraid to die. Donna was a practitioner. She had a very good consciousness. I'm not afraid to die. So let's pray for my transition. So I was like, all right, let's do that. So we did a beautiful prayer for a peaceful, loving easy transition. Well, I went to see her a few days later, and I walked in her room, and she went, like, hello, I'm still here. What's going on here? <laughs> like, I said I was ready to go. Why am I still here? Well, <laughs> this is an example of this divine discontent. Like, I said I was ready to go. Why am I still here? Well, I'll tell you why she was still here. So during all the time that she was praying for recovery, no one in her family would say goodbye because we were rooting for her to live. So when she made her decision, her family was allowed, her friends were allowed to come and say goodbye. Her room, for about a week, she lived for about another seven to ten days, her room was filled with her loved ones, singing, playing, reminiscing, having a wonderful, loving time. And so God's plan for Donna was for this healing to happen with her family and her loved ones. And then she got her prayer eventually. So um, when I ask spirit, I always ask spirit when I'm going to speak, what do you want me to say? Like, what's the message here? Loud and clear, I got trust and adjust. That's what I got. Trust and adjust. Trust God and adjust your thinking. Because sometimes we need to look at what and how we're praying for, what we are praying for and how we're praying for it, to see if any adjustments need to be made. So about mm, five years ago, when my husband Larry and I decided to stop doing foster care, we knew that we needed to get some kind of jobs, part-time jobs at least, just to keep us going and not have to spend our savings. And so immediately I got a job because I was praying for it and it showed up. And then I started praying for Larry's job. And that job just darn didn't show up. It just <laughs> didn't show up. 
And I, as I kept praying, I noticed that my prayers, you know, like my prayers started out like, thank you, God, for the great job that Larry's receiving. And then it was like, thank you, God, for the job. Okay. Okay. God, job, Larry, now, like, go, go, go. And so my friend Norma, who's a practitioner, she's not here today, but my friend Norma was asking me how it's going, and I told her. And she said, what about this? What if you change your prayer and you pray for how good Larry will feel when he's working in the most perfect job? How good will he feel? So you see, I was praying for a thing, a job. But I wasn't praying for Larry. In a way, I was praying for myself, <laughs> you know? And so I switched it up. I switched it up. And I am not kidding you. Two days later in Craigslist, there was an, a, an ad for a job delivering vintage automobiles to very wealthy customers. And my husband is the best driver in the world. He can drive any kind of rig. It was absolutely perfect. And he got that job. And he loved it. It was absolutely perfect. So trust, I was trusting God all along, <laughs> but I definitely needed to adjust what I was really praying for here. My sister in Texas, I always share about her. So she's a school teacher. She was a school teacher for over 35 years, and last year she decided to retire. And so being like me, she didn't want to just stay at home, so she ended up getting a little job at a winery. <clears throat> And she was doing a wine tasting and a tour and with a group of women. And after it was over, this lady came up to her and said, uh, you don't know me, but I know you. And she said, OK. And she said, I work at the junior college. And I just want you to know that everyone in the English department knows who your students are. We go, oh, that's an Anne Hamilton student right there. Because they are brilliant. Because they are prepared. They know how to write. They know all the things they need to know to be in college. And then she took a minute, and she looked at my sister, and she goes, what are you doing here? <laughs> right? And Anne said, well, whatever. So she went on about her business. Well, a little while later in the year, she got a job at a grocery store, a grocery store. And she was working in the grocery store, putting away stock and helping this little lady find the um, French fried onions, which nobody can find in the grocery store. And she noticed this uh, young Hispanic woman was staring at her, looked to be about 25 years old and was just staring at her. So she went over and said, you know, is there something I can help you with? And she said, are you, are you Miss Ann Hamilton? And she said, well, yes, I am. And she said, well, I was one of your students and my sisters and I, English is our second language and we were really struggling to be able to complete the exit exam for the high school, and she said, you stayed after school every day and helped us. And all three of us graduated from high school. And I just want you to know that I thank you so much for that. So my sister is awake and aware to the divine, and she recognized that something was happening here. Something's happening here. She's getting a message. And so, you know what? <laughs> she gets a phone call, and it's from the principal of the local high school, and he says, is there any way, any way that you would consider coming back? We really need you in the English department. And she is meeting with that principal tomorrow. <laughs> right. So Ernest Holmes says, nature will not let us stay in any one place too long. She will let us stay just long enough to gather the experience necessary to the unfolding and advancement of the soul. Nature demands the change in order that we may advance. Now, some of us who study and practice the science of mind for years, we can become discontented with ourselves when we think that we should be doing better than to feel angry, disappointed, anxious, or whatever. People say to me all the time, I know better. What's the matter with me? Why do I keep doing this? Well, I want you to know that usually the person who's feeling those things is about four to 10 years old. 
It's the you that had something happen to you that's stuck in your brain that keeps becoming triggered. For me, when I was around eight to 10 years old, I was always in a car with my dad who was drunk driving. So it doesn't, it makes total sense that when I get in my car, I become angry, fearful, uh, nervous, anxious, you name it, right? Our minds tend to hold on to familiar patterns, even if those patterns no longer serve us. Resistance to change can manifest as fear, doubt, or clinging to the past. Our beliefs, which are often formed through past experiences, influence how we perceive and respond to change. Negative or limiting beliefs can create resistance and hinder our ability to embrace new possibilities. Now, our book of the month is Trust, Mastering the Four Essential Trusts by Ianla Van Zandt. The four trusts are trust in self, trust in God, trust in others, and trust in life. In the section Trust in God, she says, you have to know God to trust God. The way to know God is through spiritual practice. Spiritual practice. So do you have one? Yeah? And do you practice every day? Hmm? A lot of people that I meet say that they have a spiritual practice, but they're kind of busy and it gets pushed to the end of the day or whatever. But why do we pray and meditate every day? Well, it's the same reason we brush our teeth every day. Because cred builds up, right? <laughs> Cred builds up, and we need to brush it away. And that's what the spiritual practice is all about. So in her book, on, page, uh, on pages 120 to 126, Van Zandt lays out all the elements of an effective spiritual practice, and you can design one for yourself. The elements are getting connected, getting out of the way, listening and receiving. Makes sense, doesn't it? That last one, listening and receiving, that's kind of what I'm talking about here today. So a practice for self-compassion that I use and I've recommended for other people is this. And don't, I'm not going to ask you to do it right now because it can kind of bring up a lot of emotions, but I just want you to listen to this practice and then try it when you're at home. So imagine the four to five to six-year-old you that one that had something happen and that is so frightened. Picture that person, close your eyes when you do this. Imagine this, see yourself as that young person standing right in front of you. Hold hands with that person. Ask him or her, what do you want me to know? What do you want me to know? That's a real key right there because it's usually, you know, dogs will kill you or something. I mean, who knows what it is? There's something. What do you want me to know? And then let that young one know that it, you've got this. It's not that way anymore. I'm not in the car with my dad, the drunk driver. So I've got you. You're safe. This is a spiritual practice that helps calm down that little person in you that gets all riled up about whatever it gets riled up with. And it really works. So give it a try when you have the space and the time to do such a thing. Science of Mind teaches that there's a creative intelligence or universal presence that permeates everything. It's a field of pure possibility and potentiality. It's always responsive to our thoughts and beliefs, and our thoughts have creative power. We talk about this every week. They shape our perception, emotions, and experiences. In Science of Mind, we emphasize the importance of consciously directing our thoughts towards positive and empowering beliefs. Worry is the opposite of that. We worry about the people and the things we love, but worrying over the thing you don't want to happen makes that thing happen. So when you catch yourself worrying, which is a definitely a sign of divine discontent, stop and change it up. 
Visualize and affirm what you want to have happen, not what you're afraid of. The minute you do that, the demonstration is free to show up. Discontent equals discomfort equals change. Discontent is a gift because it brings change. You have the power to consciously shape your experience of change. Embrace it as an opportunity for personal growth and transformation. Let being uncomfortable be your cue to tune in and trust God. Iyanla has this to say about trust in God. God, infinite intelligence, your higher mind, your authentic self, speaks to you within you in your own voice. In essence, trusting God means trusting the deeper essence of who you are. The challenge many of us face is that we were taught to worship an external God, an identity or being that exists somewhere outside of ourselves. In response to this teaching, most of us have come to believe that we cannot hear God and that those who do hear God are very special people. What I have discovered is that the more I trust myself, the more I hear God. I know the feeling that the presence of God generates in my body. I know the stillness that comes over me when the voice of God is speaking. I know the peace and calm that I feel when I hear that voice. And I also know the results that come when I act on what it tells me. So on a Friday, our wonderful practitioner, Gina, reached out to the Soul Support Team for prayers for a safe trip to L.A. over the weekend. She was to accompany her sister for a very important appointment and was asking for prayer for safe travels in this weather here. But on Saturday morning, Gina told the team that Spirit had absolutely guided her to cancel that trip. And this is what I mean about trust and adjust. Gina was trusting God all along, the entire time, but she also trusted herself to listen to that divine guidance and then adjust her plans. And I have no doubt that Gina felt that peace and calm that comes over you when you know that you have followed divine guidance. And so I'd like to invite the band and the choir to come on up, and I'll just kind of recap here. So I was always trusting God when I was praying for a job for Larry, but it wasn't until I adjusted the focus and the purpose of my prayer that the perfect job showed up, and it showed up immediately. When my sister trusted God to guide her career path, God showed her what an impact she has made as a teacher. All in God's time. She listened and she adjusted her vision and the phone rang with the principal on the other end. In times of discontent and discomfort, you've got to trust God and you've got to be ready to be willing to adjust. And so the call to action this week is, number one, take a look at what you're praying for. And if the demonstration is not happening, look at what needs to be adjusted in your thinking or your actions. Number two, if you have a spiritual practice that you love, do it. Do it every day. And if you need inspiration to create a new spiritual practice, get Ilanya's book. It's a for sale at the back table and go to page 120. And then three, when you find yourself feeling afraid, angry, anxious, jealous, any of those emotionally discomforting feelings, remember who is feeling that discomfort. It's your five-year-old self and that one needs some understanding and some compassion and some love. Tell him or her that they are safe and that all is well and that you've got them. And so I'd like to end with a closing prayer. So if you're comfortable closing your eyes, just take a moment and let's take a deep breath together. <sighs> 
In this moment, the presence of the divine is felt. It is a vibration that each person here feels. I feel it. I know that that vibration is present always, all the time. But in this moment, we are tuned into it. We are tuned into that radio station, KGOD. And we can feel it. We feel that vibration. We feel that love. And so I know that every person here is awake and listening to the voice of the divine. No matter what plans they may think are in store for them, no matter what they think is the right thing to do, I know that each person here is still listening, listening to that still small voice that says, maybe you should change your plans. And so I know that as we leave here today, we go out into the world trusting God. We trust the divine. We absolutely trust the divine. And we listen and we adjust where necessary. And I give thanks for the healings that are occurring right now because of this. I know that the healings have started and have and will continue. I give thanks for the demonstrations that everyone here is experiencing and everyone on Zoom as well. I give thanks for the open, loving hearts and minds of each person who can hear my voice. And so as I release these words, I know into that creative law, whatever it is to be demonstrated is being demonstrated. I release, I let go, and so it is. Namaste.